Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Romina Pesoli, and I'm part of the research team at the Applied Polymer Technology Gateway at the Technological University of the Shannon Midland Midwest. We are delighted to uh, present this webinar series together with Siobhan Matthews from Supercritical Fluid Processing and the European Medical Polymer Division of the Society of Plastics Engineers. This series of webinars in trends in polymers processing and investigation is a, a space to discuss the latest development in polymer uh, technologies with polymer experts. Before we start, I would like to remind to all of our audience that your mics are mute. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the talk. Without further ado, I would like to welcome all of our speakers uh, today. The first Polymer Training Skill Net is joining us, uh, Catherine Collins, Network Manager, Stephen O'Leary, Training Consultant, and Alan Harrington, Technical Training Specialist. Welcome you all. I'm gonna let you take control of the room now and let's start with the talk. Thanks very much, Romina, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to speak to everybody today. Hopefully, you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Fantastic. That's great. It's perfect. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank Romina Pizzoli from the Apt Applied Polymer Technology Gateway Centre, Siobhan Matthews of SCF Processing, Tews Midlands, and the Society of Plastics Engineers for giving us the opportunity to speak today. So my name is Catherine Collins, and I am Network Manager with First Polymer Training Skillnet. And today I'm just going to give an overview of what we do here at First Polymer Training and how we support industry. And my own background is I would have studied plastics engineering in Athlon RTC, as it was now to Midlands in the late 80s. And I worked in some engineering roles in Millipore and Medtronic before joining First Polymer Training back in 2001. And at that time, actually, Stephen O'Leary was the Network Manager, and uh, Stephen then took over as training consultant and I started as network manager back in 2010. So I let my colleague Stephen and Alan introduce themselves later on in the presentation, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on how First Polymer was formed. So back in 1999, we were set up by IBEC as a skill training network. So prior to that, Pat White, who some of you may know, very successfully delivered training to the sector, but decided to go back to industry around that time. So that left a big gap in the training skills provision. And at the same time, SkillNet Ireland announced funding for training networks in different sectors and regions, and IBEX successfully applied for funding and set us up back in 1999. Uh, we have our own technical training centre in Athlone, which is a fantastic resource to have for training. And we're also I said, supported by a key steering group from industry, made up of you know, CEOs, senior managers from some of the best-known companies uh, in the industry. And as you can see there, a lot of well-known companies represented. Our current chairman is uh, Kenny O'Brien from 3 A Composites, which is at Lone Extrusions, a local company. And we also have a lot of other companies represented there, Invermed, Jabal, MFP, West, JL Gore, Medtronic. You can see them all there, and also Enterprise Ireland. They're really, I suppose, fundamental in what we do, making sure they give us strategic direction and making sure that we're delivering the training and the support that industry actually needs. So, you know, they're a voluntary group, and we owe a lot of what we do to them. We're also recognized as a knowledge center for industry through Intertrade Ireland. So we have worked on a number of fusion projects on cross-border cooperations with companies based in Northern Ireland as well. We're also a QQI validated provider of further education programs in the polymer space. We're actually the only ones that provide polymer programs in further education for industry. So just to give you a little bit of background on our promoting organization, IBEC. So IBEC represents employers and there's a trade association within IBEC called Polymer Technology Ireland. And they represent all of the polymer companies, well, a lot of the polymer companies in the industry. That's headed up by my um, director, Mark McCauley. And really their role is to, I suppose, to lobby and support industry with the different you know, issues and things that they need to focus on each year. And they also support ourselves as a training network, but they also... Uh, support the Polymer Technology Apprenticeship. And that's um, managed by Trish Breen. And that Polymer Apprenticeship, as you may know, is uh, delivered by two Smithlands. We get a lot of support from machinery suppliers. I just wanted to acknowledge them. We're a not-for-profit training network, so we don't have a capital budget, if you like. So we get great support from the likes of Arberg and Fanuc through JL Gore, Krauss Maffei and Engel, and also Graham Engineering. So they supply injection molding machines, extruders for our centers. So it means we always have the latest technology and machinery available for training. 
just to give you an idea, the new Arborg on top that's coming in a few weeks' time, and we also got that new Fanock Robichaud machine and Engel and a cross Maffei injection molding machine. It's just in the last year and a half, and they're regularly replaced and updated. So it means we always have the latest technology for training, and it's great for trainees. They're always able to use the latest technologies as well. So it's a great resource to have at our centre here in Athlone. I just wanted to mention, I suppose, our collaborations. We work very closely with TUS here in Athlone in the Midlands. Obviously, as you, you probably know, TUS has a long heritage of polymer education. As I said, it's been there myself, and so, so did my colleagues, Alan and Stephen, on the call as well. So a long history of polymer education and upskilling in, in the Midlands with TUS and also with ourselves. We work very closely with Noel Gately and Romina and her colleagues in the APT Centre as well, and we hope to collaborate with them, with them more closely in the future as well, and we hope to do some training on their equipment and vice versa. So we're hoping to collaborate a lot more closely going forward. We also work with Katrina Morden. She heads up the Advanced Technology and Manufacturing Cluster. That's also based in TUS. We, uh, the Palmer Apprenticeship that I mentioned there just a few minutes ago, we were fundamental, I suppose, in the original application and in driving that forward uh, through IBEC and through uh, the support from TUS. And we're also very active members still of the consortium. And again, as I said, my colleague Trish Breen heads up that apprenticeship and supports employers in enrolling on the programme. So just to give you a little bit of background on what we do and what we do with our funding. So we get funding each year from Skillhead Ireland and the balance of our budget then comes from training course fees from member companies. So we use that grant funding to develop new programs where they're needed. So for example, the most recent one we developed was a conformal cooling program with Irish Manufacturing Research. And we've developed lots of others over the years, but that's the most recent one. But primarily we use our funding to subsidize training, usually by about 30 to 40%. So it just means it's more cost effective for companies to avail of the training. It's not just our training, we also subsidize training from other providers as well. So it's not all technical polymer processing training, but we do provide other support for companies as well. Over the years, we've developed many programs. We have in excess of 70 available now on our website. And you can see the full list on firstpolymer.com. Most of what we provide would be in injection molding, extrusion, materials, design, and PLCs. And Stephen and Alan will talk more about those later. But I just wanted to mention, I suppose, we do a lot of tailoring of programs to suit companies. Some companies might want an injection molding module and maybe another module from design or materials. And we regularly, you know, tailor those programs and then tweak them further to suit the particular issues or the needs of the companies in question. And again, they're all subsidized um, by funding. Uh, most of our programs are QI accredited. Some aren't because there's not no requirement for them to be, but I suppose there is a clear progression path now, which is fantastic. So people can progress from module one and injection one onto module two and so on. But there is a, a clear route there to upscale for people in industry. We also have a dedicated training center, as I said, but we have a, a very strong panel of trainers that we've developed over many years. Many of them subject matter experts in their own area. Many of them, you know, service and automation engineers. So a lot of our training is very hands-on and very practical and very much, I suppose, aligned to what the industry needs. Most of our training programs are also available in-house that make it more easier, I suppose, for companies to access training and to avail of training rather than having people to travel for, for the program. We've also developed a lot of e-learning over the years to support, they're, they're free to access and they really support learning before people come on the courses. The most recent one we did was extrusion just last year, and it means people are up to speed on the terminology and the machine cycle. So it just means they kind of hit the ground running when they do come on day one of the training course. We also co-deliver and subsidize fees on third level programs. So there's a level six, a level seven, and a level eight. And I suppose just to give you a little bit of background there, back in 2007, 2008, there was an acute shortage of polymer engineers. So we got together with AIT as we were at the time now too, and IT Sligo, our steering group, and we had a focus group of many companies across the industry, just to try and see what kind of modules should be in. What do you want your polymer engineer to be able to do at the end of an engineering degree program? So in 2009, that level seven program kicked off with the first graduates coming out in 2011. Uh, then a number of years later, back in 2014, the action plan for jobs highlighted the shortage of polymer technicians. So we developed a level six certificate in polymer technology, which is a one year long program. And then more recently, a level eight honors degree was uh, developed with ATU, formerly IT Sligo. So essentially now there's a progression route from level six to level seven to level eight. We deliver content on all three programs on the level six. We deliver two polymer modules and Stephen delivers one of those, plastics, materials and processing. But we also deliver materials for the polymer industry in the level seven and polymer processing practicals. And we also deliver a recycling of polymers module on the level eight. And again, we subsidize the fees to employers by 30%. And 
So it just means that to develop talent within your organization, it's much easier to participate in these programs. These programs were designed for people working full-time in industry. So they're delivered on a part-time basis, primarily online. Sessions are recorded. There's lots of online resources. So they're really accessible for people. It is possible to work full-time and get a degree or certificate level qualification, which is fantastic. This is, um, I can't take any credit for this graphic, Sean Lyons from TUS, the Dean of Engineering, designed this graphic last year for a webinar we jointly did on the supports for industry. And I just really updated with the latest logos with the new technological university of TUS here in Midlands, Shannon Midwest, and ATU, IT, formerly IT Sligo. So for the first time ever, I suppose, there's a number of routes you can progress in Polymer. You can do the level set five courses with ourselves. We also do bespoke training, as I mentioned. But then you can, there's the option for a full-time honours degree with TUS in mechanical and polymer engineering. And we're delighted to have those students in their year three to come into a DO, DOE practical with us every year. Then there's the polymer apprenticeship route, which is again another option for people working in industry to do it on a part-time basis off the job release over a three-year period. And then there's the part-time ones I just mentioned on the previous slide, the level six, level seven, and level eight. And then if you want to progress even further, you can do a master's level qualification with TUS Midlands. And then there's obviously an option to do a PhD with either choose or ATU. So it's just great to show, I suppose, all the different pathways you can take to upskill in polymer and you can exit or enter where you like. And it, it's just a great resource to be able to have those different options now, which we didn't have in the past. So three options, the full-time degree, the polymer apprenticeship or the part-time degree in design for industry. Uh, three years ago now, we celebrated 20 years of supporting the polymer industry in Ireland. I suppose I just wanted to mention that it's, we are a not-for-profit training network designed to, to meet the needs of industry. But we're here not just to deliver training, but to be, I suppose, signposted companies if they need any support, whether it's to APT or the MRI or CISD within a tools for mechanical or chemical testing or whatever it is. We're here to support industry. We have also delivered a lot of programs over the years that were free to convert people into the industry as well. So we have people that have worked in retail, transport, that are now working as polymer technicians and engineers, which is absolutely fantastic. We also run a number of technical seminars and events, often jointly with APT or TUS, and we're very much involved in the annual polymer seminar that runs every year in Hudson Bay, which is run by the Institute of Materials and more recently IBEC as well. So I suppose we'd I'd encourage people to reach out and get in touch if we can help in any way at all. A couple of highlights from the past year I just wanted to mention. So last year we expanded our centre and my colleague Alan Harrington started in July 2020 and that started an expansion I suppose where we doubled our training hall space. So we now have an injection moulding training hall and we have a second hall that houses our automation, our extrusion line and our maintenance training boards. So it's fantastic to have that, to double our space initially. Uh, the virtual launch we held in November was really a great event. We had key industry speakers, we had box pops from past trainees talking about their experience of the training and how it's changed their lives getting into the industry and we had a really good panel discussion between our steering group um, and some key members from industry and IBEC just on the key issues that the industry is facing on sustainability and skills attraction and retention which we know is a, a big one. Another key highlight was the resumption of face-to-face -face training so we you know Stephen will talk later about live streaming and injection molding training over the last few years which has been really successful and really well done. We were delighted to be able to you know welcome trainees back so we have changed the model of how we deliver some training some is blended now we recognize the benefits of online, but great to have trainees back in the center. And just last week, we had three courses running. Stephen was live streaming an injection molding course. We had a maintenance PLC course, and we had a medical polymers course, all running at the same time in the center, which was great. Another highlight was we um, launched a new research project. So we've never, never done research before, and we partnered with the TUS in Athlone and um, put together a report on spatial skills development for industrial training. And that was really interesting, something we'd never done before, as I said. And it had been looked at a second and third level um, perspective before, but never uh, with industry participants. So some really interesting qualitative and quantitative findings on that. And it's on our website, the, the report, if you'd like to see it. So it was just really, really excited to be involved in that. Just before I finish, I just want to briefly mention sustainability. And we know that's a key issue for the industry. And you know, the, the industry doesn't always have the best image when it comes to plastics. So we recognize this, I suppose, particularly um, with Polymer Technology Ireland and their work with lobbying and, and policy. There's so many directives coming at industry now on you know, single-use plastics, tethering of caps, all of this, you know, trying to incorporate recycled material into your products. 
So we, I suppose we recognize that the difficult landscape for companies to navigate. So we decided to um, service some companies last year. 47 companies responded. And a number of them, um, really, essentially, we were asking them, would they welcome some support on developing a sustainability strategy or a framework for the industry? A number of them had done something in this space, but quite a lot of them didn't, and they didn't know where to start. So they said they would really welcome some support. So we were successful in securing funding, and we partnered with Irish Manufacturing Research in Mullingar. We issued a more detailed questionnaire looking at more polymer-specific um, content and questions. We asked, we put together a list of potential topics for masterclasses around sustainability, and we asked companies to pick the ones that thought were most relevant. Uh, so we got the results of the survey, we analysed them, we scheduled masterclasses. And the next step then was to look at champions. So each company, this, this was all 100% funded, by the way, no cost to the companies. So we recognised that it's important for a company to have sustainability champions in their organisation if success, sustainability is going to be successful. In order to embed it in the culture, you need a champion, essentially. So um, we actually started. We kicked off on the 19th of May in Irish Manufacturing Research in Mullingar. We had some really good case studies from companies like Morgan, Freeform, Novelplast, and IFF Plastics, just talking about their sustainability journeys, how they embedded in the culture, how they changed their processing practices, material use, all of that. And then we had an input from some um, solution providers. So we had Adable, they talked about green solvents. We had control stations, they talked about PID controllers, polar ice tech, um, dry ice cleaning, rather than using solvents. So it was really, really exciting. The next set of masterclasses ran last week on eco design and life cycle analysis. And now I suppose we're acutely aware of how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much is involved in life cycle analysis. It's really a complex area. We also looked at eco design and looking at material replacements, you know, invented screws and barrels to avoid the need for drying materials, designing out features that will, I suppose, increase cycle times. You know, so thick wall sections will mean longer cycle times. So that's not good either. So looking at all of those features at the design stage. And then tomorrow we're running our last series of masterclasses on renewables and sustainable certifications. So again, we have the recordings of these um, masterclasses and we'll have the recordings from tomorrow afterwards as well. So people are welcome to gain access to those if they're interested. So as I said, the next step is to look at the sustainability champions, which we hope to start in the next few weeks. And again, it's looking at the company's core values, doing a series of analysis on you know, SWAT, risk, PESL, just to see where, they, where the company needs to start, what they need to do across the various uh, departments within the organization. And then really looking at leadership skills and communication that's so important when it comes to sustainability and trying to get everybody's buy-in within an organization. And at the end of that process, the champions will have a plan, an action plan with targets, who, how, and when, so they know they're on a journey, there's metrics that need to be measured, and they'll be able to start embedding sustainability and, and developing actions for their company. We will have a report later in the year with the whole framework and also case studies from the companies involved and also some content from the masterclass that will give people some you know, key tips on how to be more sustainable in their organizations across polymer processing. We hope that will be published in Q3 uh, this year. So that is it from me. Um, I know we'll have questions and answers at the end, but I'm just going to hand over to my colleague um, Stephen O'Leary now to talk about training. Thanks very Thanks. much. Thanks, Katrin. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here just while I'm sharing it just a little bit of my background this is year 22 that I've been doing training with first polymer um, be, previous to that I worked as a plastics uh, engineer in Boston Scientific in Galway for a few years and before that I worked in extrusion as a technician and supervisor for four years in Tullamore in a company that was Sherwood Medical but has changed names quite a few times since then um, and before that, I, I was uh, plastics. Um, sorry, I studied plastics engineering in AIT. So I'm just going to share a slideshow. Hopefully, you can see this okay. It's perfect. Okay, great. So, First Polymer runs a number of training courses. We have four injection molding courses, four modules, uh, four days each seems to have been a sweet spot that we've kind of settled on over, over the years. Uh, we also run a fundamentals of injection molding course, which is like an introduction for people that maybe want to do just a little bit in advance of coming on an injection molding course, or else aren't going to be working in a technical role and maybe working in a supporting role. Um, typically, people working in sales, marketing, um, you know, quality, um, those kind of uh, positions. We have a quality engineers uh, course specifically for quality engineers that want to learn more 
really about the root causes of defects. That's kind of what we focus on um, and the terminology. So when they're discussing issues with molding engineers, for example, and with their customers, that they have a better idea of the root causes of the issues. We have a troubleshooting surface defects and in injection molding course, which was just jointly developed last year with another trainer. Um, I present one day. We've got another trainer presenting a second day. Um, we've got then supporting, not quite supporting courses, but I suppose um, Courses in a similar area would be plastic part design and mold design um, de are delivered by Peter Cracknell from the UK. The conforming cooling, conformal cooling course that Catherine said has just been developed. And a couple of other courses like SMED, single minute exchange of dyes and design of experiments. So all the courses that we uh, have come up with over the last number of years have primarily been coming from requests from industry where they're saying, do you run a course in for example, conformal cooling, or, you know, I want to learn more about plastic part design. And then we go looking for a trainer and we've got a very strong, um, you know, very strong links to the industry. We, we chat to people in the industry, find out who might be a good fit and eventually settle on trainers. We also do extrusion blow molding and thermoforming training courses as typically four day um, training courses, obviously in those areas. We've got a suite of validation and medical device type courses product and process validation, project management for medical devices, and a conversion to med tech course for engineers that are outside the plastics industry. They want to try and get in, but they can't really find a foothold in the plastics industry. So this, this gives them the kind of terminology and a little bit of the background so that um, hopefully they can get positions. And quite a lot have been very successful at it, getting into the medical industry, which is obviously very strong in Ireland. We've then got um, plastic materials courses. So plastic materials selection, there's a, a weakness, if you like, in the knowledge of plastic materials across the industry. And this isn't just across Ireland, it's across basically Europe and across everywhere, really. Um, a general weakness in knowledge about plastic materials. So we've been working at trying to, trying to move that towards a stronger knowledge base over the last number of years. Uh, quite a lot of these courses are delivered by Peter Cracknell in the UK, uh, who comes over to Ireland or else delivers some of these online. So of the four injection molding modules, they can be delivered online face-to-face -face or as a mix um, at our training facility in Athlone or on site. There's advantages and disadvantages to each of those. Uh, generally, what we do is we chat to the company looking to send people on courses and we just spell out, here's the pros and cons. Um, our training center is a bit quieter than in company. Generally, it's easier to get access to the machines and so on. Some companies like to have people pressing buttons on their own machines, typically if they're operators or they're fairly new to the molding side. The courses are typically built around the, pro the progression from a machine operator to engineering level. So that would be understand how the machine works, which is module one, troubleshoot problems, module two, do tool trials, sim studies, scientific injection molding studies, module three. And then module four puts a bit of more of the engineering background to uh, the sim study type work, tool trial type work, things like um, how to calculate gate sizes to, to work out shear, that kind of stuff. Um, and John is very well known across the industry. He's been around molding for quite a number of years quite a lot longer than I have. Um, so if you're doing in-company courses, every in-company course, rather than companies saying, can you let us know about the courses that you have? We generally start with the question, what issue do you want to solve? And here's a list of typical ones uh, that I've come up with or the companies have come up with over the last few years. Um, reducing tool handling repair cost, that was one. Basically, there was a lot of damage to tool handling from an overmolding medical company and the feedback was basically their costs have been reduced significantly. And if you want to have a look down through these yourselves, rather than reading down through them, you can see there's specific issues. A lot of it is down to um, having people being able to come in from another shift and take over and start up and shut down machines. Some general upskilling companies moving into higher, you know, um, moving into an area basically where they, need, where they need more experience and more expertise. But fundamentally, the training revolves around understanding how the machine works, understanding the, pro the parameters in the cycle, understanding the root cause of troubleshooting defects, um, and understand how to do tool trials. So there's not that much of a difference, um, but we do certainly have a focus, a very strong focus on the specific issues the companies have. So our injection mold in module one course is really about trying to understand the machine, be able to understand different terminology parts of the machine, what, what the machine does, what are the various stages in the cycle, be able to install and remove molds, set up from a blank program, understand the basics of troubleshooting, fault findings, the root cause of your basic uh, surface defects, I should say basic molding defects, flash, burn marks, well lines, short shots, that kind of stuff. Restart and stop the machine, purge out, and obviously follow safety instructions. So that's really as much as we can squeeze into four days. So it's a pretty intensive course. Um, even for someone with some experience, you know, we, we basically push them a little bit harder. Um, 
module two then is really about troubleshooting. So commonly troubleshooting all of the common faults plus some um, surface defects, which you can see there. Clearly follow logical and systematic steps. So really module two is all about using data to drive decisions and trying to get away from kind of finger in the ear type stuff, you know, or this worked last week, so I'm gonna try it again this week. So trying to understand very, very systematically and logically how to troubleshoot and, and use data to drive the decisions. Um, that data would include things like the process history page, injection pressure curves, screw position curves, injection speed curves, and the same with holding pressure, um, the screw speed during holding, et cetera, be able to, to read and understand and look at the patterns uh, of those curves and what they're telling us. And basically look at uh, the basics of plastic materials then, which would be amorphous and crystalline materials, shrinkage, warpage, um, sink marks, that kind of thing. You know, what's the difference between mold and polycarbonate and polystyrene, for example, or polycarbonate and polypropylene, and why do they react differently? So it's very much a practical understanding of plastic materials from a molding point of view. And the next thing then would be just to record the data from the machine to try and use it to aid troubleshooting. So which, what's the, what is the critical data to, un, to understand? Module three is really a tool trial, of course. So module three, again, following the industry, um, typically senior technicians and engineers would do SIM studies or tool trials. So trainees working on their own to, to diagnose and eliminate all co common defects. This is really just a recap on the module two course and then using data from the machine again. So the first day in the course really is a recap of module two, preparing for a tool trial on day two and a tool trial on day three, and then a wrap up exams on day four. Um, so that's pretty much it. You know, two practical tool trials, two SIM studies completed during that course. And by doing two of them, we typically come across the type of issues you're gonna get in production, or at least a, as many of them as we can. So the, the general principles that we've been following for the last 22 years, um, developing training courses would be, a lot of it's based on repetition. I need to find new ways of repeating the same thing. You know, people tend to understand certain areas like mold opening and closing quite easily, but they have more difficulty on back pressure and decompression distance and so on. So by, by repeating the same content, but coming at it from a different angle, I find it's a good way of embedding the knowledge. So we start off with a theory session. We are pretty much always have a Q&A session on the first day to check understanding. That would be typically, can you explain the molding cycle from start to finish? Can you tell me what settings you have during the plasticizing stage, et cetera? We have lots of quizzes during the week. Trainees are encouraged to do homework in the evenings, especially if they're staying away from home and they've got a little bit of free time. There's obviously plenty of practical sessions in the molding machines. And then a big driver, a big motivator for the course will be an end of course written exam and an end of course practical test. So it's kind of like continuous assessment, which I find works really well all week. Um, we obviously want to build rapport with trainees. If, if someone feels on edge, they're not going to learn. So we want to tr make them feel at ease at the start. We have always look for trainers that have a keen interest in trainees learning and developing. So trainers that actually get a kick out of having people doing well on the course and actually learning and being interested in answering questions um, and being interested in, in showing an interest in the trainees. The courses are built in modular format. At least my molding courses are with each course starting as a refresher in the previous course. We acknowledge that our trainees are not going to remember everything, no matter how good we think our training is or how, how hard we try. Uh, trainees won't remember everything, so the courses are built that there's a recap and you're constantly regurgitating the same information. Typically, trainees will struggle with things like a switchover position, trying to visualize that, especially someone reasonably new to molding. Understanding back pressure and decompression distance, being able to describe the root cause of common defects. For example, what's a burn mark? It's an air trap in the mold rather than it's a temperature issue. Um, and then remembering the cause and effect between process settings and defects. So the certain terminology, like it's like any language, you know, you got your vowels and et cetera, that you have to learn. And we want to try, we need to get people to learn. And there's a certain amount of memory involved. So the repetition certainly works there. Typically people understand the mold setup because it's very visual. They can see what's happening rather than the injection side, which is something of a closed box. So to do that, we use analogies. So for example, everyday analogies to explain technical concepts. So on the left is a toggle lock machine. And on the right is a vice grips. They basically are the same. One is a lot bigger than the other, obviously, but there's the same basic mechanical um, function between the two of them. So as we're adjusting the toggle, it's like we're adjusting the knob on the vice grips. And when we get to a lockout position, it's the distance between the two handles of the vice grips that you're that you're trying to set. So by by explaining it in that method, people are able to understand it better. Um, decompression is like like the trigger on a silicon gun. When you release the trigger, the piston pulls back and it takes the pressure out of the shot. So that's basically just a visual picture to understand exactly what's happening. We know the screw moves back. We know it's, we know it's pulling the screw back. Why is it doing it? It's trying to take out the back pressure. So analogies like that, again, injection speeds like cruise control in a car, 
injection pressure is like engine revs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I try and use analogies with everyday things to try and simplify really. The whole thing is the, the, the KISS, simp the KISS um, system, keep it simple basically and you know break it down. So I try and group settings together as well. So for example, instead of saying that if you want to fix a well line, you can increase your barrel temperature or your mold temperature or fill them all quicker or put more frictional heat in. I just group these together as what I call the five heat effects. Barrel temperatures, RPM speed and back pressure, create the melt temperature before you inject. And then the mold temperature and the actual fill time or the injection time determine the amount of cooling going across the mold. So later on during any courses, if I say to somebody, what's the root cause of a well line, I'm expecting them to say the five heat effects. Or not the root cause, but what's the fix for a well line is five heat effects. And then you say, okay, what are the five heat effects? And then that's your language base that you need to know those. So you know you've got a little toolbox there ready to go. Rather than, as I say, having loads of parameters being plucked willy-nilly out of the sky. So as... Uh, the trainees come in the courses when they leave rather than saying good luck and uh, we'll see you at the next course or see you sometime enjoy the rest of your career basically we give them an online library um, of supplementary information which i've been basically dumping online into a folder and are neatly grouping together in folders over the last 15 years or so so trainees if they want to have the interest they can go in and just learn a bit more and all these um, articles and so on are all written in pretty much in layman's terms to try and make it easy to read. So it's a good resource for company or for trainees after they leave us. Trainees are generally paired with another trainee at a similar level where possible when they're doing practical work. They know they're going to have individual time in the machines, uh, maybe day three or four. So there's no safety net going to be there. So they have to learn. And we use we encourage course manuals at the start of the course, but we slowly try and wean trainees off the course manuals so that by the end of the course, they're basically working themselves without using the manuals as a crutch. So you have to be careful when you give people too much information that they, um, they don't just literally take something from a book and put it on the screen without really thinking and understanding what's going on. So as Katrin mentioned, we also have e-learning modules. So here's a screenshot from one on ejectors and module one e-learning. It's about a 10 hour um, self-paced e-learning package that all trainees get before they come in our module one and two courses and they get to basically have a look at that before they start so that they're more familiar with the terminology more familiar with what's going on so as Katrin said they hit the ground running and after the course as well they get a guidance document which uh, we encourage companies to support the trainee with which is a list really of tasks to do over in this case a 12-week period mold changing and machine starting up troubleshooting basic troubleshooting on module one to try and embed the information and the knowledge from the course uh, because you do lose it very quickly if you're not using it. I try and break defects down into single line explanations. So again, instead of saying with a sink mark, you can use more holding pressure or your gate size, your holding time. I try and break it down. The root cause of shrinkage is, or the root cause of a sink mark is shrinkage, and the root cause of shrinkage is either thermal shrinkage or crystallinity as the material crystallizes and the molecules pack in tightly together. So first of all, your holding pressure has to be high enough, and then if the, let's say the shrinkage time in the writer is taken three seconds, that means your gate needs to be open for more than three seconds. So let's say we'll try and keep a gate freeze time of around four seconds, which we can measure. And then that means we're holding time needs to be packing out, holding pressure needs to be packed out for longer than four seconds. So our hold time then is going to be set around five seconds. So it's trying to understand again, the root cause, cause and effect here, trying to make it simple, um, explaining relatively technical concepts in a simple way as possible. We use technology online, uh, YouTube, the one on the left there called the engineering guy um quite a good nine and a half minute overview of injection molding on the right hand side we have a process simulator which is basically allowing technicians or trainees i should say to play with settings and you know experiment and see what happens if you increase the injection speed what are the positive things on the part but also what are the negative issues you're going to see and what happens to cycle time and so on so this is developed by a bunch of injection molding trainers in the uk back around 1996 they did a really good job on it um, it does exactly what a real molding machine would do so it's a very good troubleshooting and training tool not troubleshooting but a training tool that we use um, regularly across all our courses so all of our training has a high practical to theory ratio. Um, day one is now delivered online. We find it, it works really well for most trainees not to have to take an extra day away from family typically and companies not having to pay for an extra day accommodation. Um, trainees are encouraged to ask questions right from the start on day one and our continuous assessment is delivered through online quizzes through Microsoft Forms. We use a form filling service called PDF Filler, which I'll have a look at in a second. And then basically Q&A sessions all through and of course the practical assessments on the machines and tasks set on the machines. So here's an example of a couple of questions from our, one of our online training quizzes through Microsoft Forms. 
Uh, root cause of sink marks, you're given some examples. And if there's no venting or not enough venting, what are the potential issues? So trainees get to do these 100 questions. They get to look back over the questions, get to see the answers. And by looking at the answers, they get to see where, where they fell down. And if they're not hitting a kind of a benchmark of around typically 70%, I'm expecting on you know, maybe day two of a module one course, um, if they're down at, say, 45, 50, 55%, they have the option of just doing this again. Um, it's not as part of the final course assessment, uh, like as in QQI certified exam results, but it is a very good way of learning about the process. And also I can send them this link through a um, PDF filler, it's called. Uh, it's basically a form filling service where they get to fill out the Arborg machine virtually. And then I can bring it up on my screen straight away and I can go, okay, you've got too much speed here at the end or too much pressure or mold safety, whatever it is, you want to watch that. And then they go, can go back and get the option to do it again. So in the bottom right corner, you can see I've given them some um, notes on the machine that they're setting up to, to guide them. Uh, we also use OBS Studio and a plugin. So my, my uh, uh, iPads have become high definition monitors. So here's a screenshot from one I was running last week. Uh, OBS Studio allows me to basically clone my screen, um, clone the iPad on my screen. I also use Dried Cam with a Samsung phone, an Android phone, and that allows me basically to mix and match and custom set resolutions on the screens and so on. So I have hotkeys set up. So when I'm delivering online training, I can just press a key for the main screen here, press a key for the push button controller, press a key for the mold, press a key for the um, to show the parts or press another key and have any combination of any screens that I want to show. So it's quite easy, quite visual. So trainees can literally just sit back and just watch the machine and set up online. We also have practical and detailed course manuals. They've been revised up to six times. I think we're on revision six in our module two manual or module one manual, I should say. Um, and we try and break down the manuals and deliver them in a way that's very easy to read. So layman's terms, effectively, um, no large words, no not excessively technical language. Um, and then when we're doing our module two course, we're looking in detail at things like pressure curves. So here you can see we've changed 10 injection speeds and we're looking at the effect on the pressure on the bottom right. And we're also looking to see, is there a linear increase in speed on the top right? So we can look at things like machine calibration and machine issues. And we can also see the effect of injection speed and viscosity because that effectively tells you the pressure on here. So this is the kind of area that we get into on module two and three, especially. Um, here's a bunch of screenshots from various different um, interventions, troubleshooting jobs that I was doing uh, in different companies over the years. So I use these as examples as well. And I challenge trainees to tell me what is a spike in the middle of the top curve on the left hand side, for example, what's going on there? And what are we looking at on the bottom left curve, which is the machine torque and the screw position during plasticizing? And what does it tell us? You know, I'm trying to understand, as I say, the data from the machine. Okay, so that's me uh, finished. Hopefully, I didn't go on too long. Um, Alan, I'm going to hand over to you, please. Great, Steve. Thanks. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide, that's fine. So. Thanks um, to Ramina and Toos for giving us this platform here. So um, my name is Alan Harrington and um, I'm the newest member actually of FPT, First Polymer Training, uh, started in July 2020. And my role here is technical training specialist. So primarily work with uh, industry to assess training needs and, and try to design um, training programs for them. Um, I've over 20 years experience myself in the polymer processing sector uh, about 17 of those with um, with Medtronic recently and uh, have worked in various areas in production um, in the tool room R&D and engineering functions also so um, I'm just going to talk to you a bit about the maintenance programs that we run so um, <clears throat> so yeah our electrical maintenance course um, is a four-day offering uh, with the option to do uh, one day add-on accreditation, which would generally take place one month after after the course itself. Um, the trainer that delivers the course has over 30 years experience, both in machine installation and technical in, um, engineering support. You know, we feel it's vitally, vitally important for us that um, our trainers have, real ex have extensive real-life industry um, experience, which is what trainees look for. Um, so, Kind of just to talk about the training boards themselves, as you can see in the picture there, um, pre-COVID, pre um, it was a different setup. We would have had trainees sharing boards, um, but as new restrictions came in, um, we, we kind of realized that, you know, each each trainee would really need their own board. So um, so we invested heavily to accommodate six, six trainees per course. 
what we found from this was that uh, the training was more challenged, um, you know, due to the fact that they had to push themselves that bit harder um, to complete the wiring of all the circuits that you see on the boards um, without too much too much help or inter intervention. So uh, feedback from the trainees was very, very positive. They found it um, a tough course, but one that they learned a lot from. So and um, certainly they could bring back into their own jobs um, whatever they actually did learn here. So. Um, Companies themselves tell us the value of the uh, um, of the training, you know, especially the impact on their uh, production lines, where you know the downtime is kept to a minimum. Um, so the fact that you know process tech technicians can now um, fix basically general general electric par um, electrical problems without having to call in electricians, um, something that I certainly um, experienced myself, um, especially when I worked for the medical device company. Um, approximately eight years ago, the company saw that they needed to upskill their maintenance and process techs. Uh, downtime analysis would have shown that there was significant loss of production on the off shifts, the likes of the even shift or the night shift, where you wouldn't have had a specialized electrician, you know. Um, and what we found from doing the training was that, you know, all of a sudden you could fix the simple falls like a blown heater band. Um, if a thermocouple needed to be replaced, uh, fuses blown, sensors that were faulty, so on. So um, we all found the course to be very, very practical and give us a great understanding of how to use a multimeter to fault find. And especially to be able to navigate an electrical drawn, um, you know, as well. So the impact of the, that training to Medtronic actually led um, to a reduction in the downtime and increased product productivity. Um, the course itself it, it gives the it gives the trainees I suppose the knowledge, skill and the competence to fix faults and um, and replace electrical components. Um, really considering safety as a priority, so we really go through the lockout tagout procedures, um, which is a priority on the course. You know, um, the course will show them um, hazards, you know, potential hazards when they are working near electrical equipment. Um, so they will know when it is time to call in an experienced electrician. Um, the training board, as you can see, it has um, it starts off with a bit of domestic single phase, and moves on to um, to constructing control circuits using typical components. Um, includes um, functioning control switches, emergency control switches, normally open, normally normally closed uh, switches, auxiliary, you know, um, thermal thermal overloads, and so on. Um, the course then finally looks at uh, three-phase motors and transformers. So uh, we are seeing a lot of companies kind of sending new new people back every year um, that they want to train up as well. So um, rather than companies having you know electrical departments, they want they want people to be able to uh, fix the fix the machines, especially if the faults are simple enough. So um, okay, Steve, you might move on to the next one. So. That's the electrical. So the next one I'm going to talk about is automation and P PLCs. So um, I suppose, um, you know, from the perspective, you know, the automation, we need to consider what is automation engineering. So it's basically, I suppose, taking a traditional method of manufacturing process and automating that process. Um, you know, if you want to enhance the quality, quantity and consistency of your product. Um, you know, to achieve modern tech technology that includes mechanical, elect uh, electrical, and safety systems, cameras, things like human human machine in, uh, inter interfaces, imaging, uh, robotics, um, to automate um, a process. And as we know, programmable logic logic controllers are at the heart of what drives all of the functions on an automation process. Um, and the main difficulty. You know, raised by the advance of automation is one of education and training. Um, some probably feel alienated and intimidated by this and are hindered, you know, the full acceptance of automation into plant um, amongst, the, um, amongst the users. Um, companies, I suppose, come to us looking for PLC training because, you know, they experience downtime in their automation process and, you know, have to rely on um, often expensive tech support that may only be available during the daytime hours. So, um, and like, you know, often faults are simple in nature, I suppose, but it's just a lack of understanding of how to read a PLC code that results in equipment being left down. So um, 
I suppose first polymer training, we you know we 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 work again with a very specialised trainer to to kind of deliver these programs. Um, you know he's actually an automation engineer himself and a and a systems integration specialist. He's thirty years industry ex, um, you know you know experience and during the lockdown, you know in the absence of face to face training, uh, we were able to move you know his two day introduction to PLC and SCADA to an online. Uh, platform called automation automation juke, jukebox so that was very very good um you know it it meant we could kind of keep keep up skilling people out there so um his training also covers um alan bradley uh, seaman step seven and somatic and the trainer himself has custom built the kits the training training kits so you know i suppose what the trainee tends to get from it is to be able to, to design and write plc um logical programs and understand their structures which can be complicated enough so they you know they're able to trouble troubleshoot and fault find plc hardware software issues around the plant machinery using their own their own equipment like lap, laptops with specific software to integrate these complex um complex uh, systems so uh, the course you know it, it involves participants in workshops um designed to really develop their own applications um, and advance their existing programming skills uh to fall to fault find uh also and it just gives them that increased level of understanding as to how automation systems generally work um but there there are a lot of functions there i'm not going to go into them all there's too many to mention but um um, if you want, you'll find a comprehensive list of, of, of the course of the course content on our website, firstpolymer.com. And um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, um, we're all here. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, Alan, and Catherine for that. Uh, we'll start with a few questions. Um, if, if regardless to sustainability. Is there a common or recurrent query or demand or worry that the industry um, is is presenting to you? Um, I'll take that one more minute. That's okay. I suppose yeah. um, just based on the survey and talking to companies, um, they're they're worried about sustainability for a number of different reasons. First of all, even to attract uh, to attract talent, because people, actually young people are very interested in sustainability, so they only want to work with an organisation that does, you know does is sustainable and observes sustainable practices and um, obviously the nature of polymer processing there's a lot of things that can be done but i think there's a lot of lack of materials knowledge as well and looking at i suppose they know that eco design is incredibly important and not all companies if they're contract manufacturers or you know if they're they have a parent company they're not involved at the design stage they're just making the component that they're told to make essentially but i think it's such a huge area and it's only in the last year that I've realized myself what a huge area it is and it can be down to, you know, everyone thinks of you know saving energy, saving water, maybe replacing the material, looking at that, but there's so much, so many other areas to it, even, you know, apart from, you know, green energy or green pensions for your employees, it's just a, such a vast area and we talked about it on the day and we were in IMR Mullingar, the first masterclass, talking to companies who have started on that journey and done a huge amount, but there's still so much to do. So we're talking about how do you start? So the first step really is, I suppose, just to look at the basics, the, the water, the materials. The, can you Do you have any influence of the design of the products that you're using? And, you know, I suppose embedding sustainability across your organization, even if it's even if it's putting in electrical vehicle charging points, all of those kind of things do start to, you know, have, have an impact on the culture within an organization. But um, as I said, the topics we chose for the masterclasses were certifications because customers are driving that. So suppliers to, you know are, are being told by their customers they need to have this certification or be aligned to this eco values or whatever it is so they're they're trying to navigate that so it's, it's it's kind of everything really but the critical one really will be for retaining talent you know and attracting young people in, into these positions going forward will be to embrace sustainability and obviously there's so many directives and penalties coming down the line mm -hmm. that they know it has to be done as well but it's such it's such a huge area but when we have our report all compiled later this year hopefully we'll have a better handle it on it ourselves as well but um as i said it's, it's such such a vast area absolutely yeah that's a very interesting um, um 
the, the factor of the talent, uh, retaining the talent, that's, that's like a, a factor I was considering as a polymer uh, scientist or engineer that I am. So, <laughs> um, and the master classes, where can people find them? So the master classes, the last ones are happening tomorrow, but I do have the recording. So if anybody would like to, they can just, on our mic contributes, so they're just pop me an email and I'd be happy to send the link for somebody to download them and watch them in their own time. Um, I don't have the recordings of the first session, but I hope to have them soon. I have the recordings of the eco design life cycle analysis and I'll have the recordings for the renewables extended certifications after they run tomorrow. Perfect, thanks. Um, I have a question here. Uh, the first polymer training accept international based trainees? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, Romina, because we're, we're part funded through the National Training Fund through Skillnet Ireland, that exempts us. We, we can only train people that are working and living in Ireland. Um, but if somebody really wants to attend a course, we have accommodated people in the past. Obviously, we don't charge them any fee if we can, if, if the space allows and somebody really wants to do a program. But strictly speaking, because of our funding model, um, we're restricted to training um, people with, with based within the Republic of Ireland. But if somebody is really interested in something, I would encourage them just to pop me an email and you know, if there's something we can do, we'd certainly be happy to do it. Great. Yeah, a follow up of that question is that what if the cost is covered by the trainees themselves? Does that change any? It, it Maybe this cost. Unfortunately, for individuals, uh, it's supposed to be uh, the funding is to make training more cost effective for uh, the company. So we're not supposed to, so we don't. But as I said, if somebody really wants to do a training course and we can accommodate them and there is a slash, you know, we, we'd certainly work something out. That's all I would say. <laughs> Um, uh, Ramina, um, Ramina, just sorry. on that, I would do quite a bit of, of work with Northern Ireland companies as well, just myself outside Skillness, okay. just in case anyone's looking from Northern Ireland, you know, we're not going to turn anybody away, there's, there's, we'll always find a way, basically. That's, that's great to know. Uh, do you have scientific studies courses in injection molding and do you plan on going any 3D printers or LSR courses in the future? Well, we definitely do. I've got to let Stephen answer the scientific studies because he, he would cover that in injection molding modules three and four. But we have done, um, we did develop an additive manufacturing course with IMR a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, we, we would hope to run that again. And I might let Alan mention, talk about LSR because that's kind of a collaboration with APT as well. So I'll maybe hand over to Stephen first to talk about the scientific studies. Yeah, so our module three course is based around sim study. So that course is effectively doing a sim study on a Tuesday and a Wednesday on our machines in Athlone. If I'm doing it in company, I'll typically try and pick um, a, a, a validation that the company is doing or some product they need to do a sim study on. So do a live one. Uh, sim studies can range managing from one day to about six weeks, depending on the company and how much testing they want to do and so on and whether they want to include a DOE. So really what we do, and I had this question yesterday from a company and I said, look, if you just tell us exactly what your plans are, it's often driven by their customers. So they have to get their customers to clarify exactly what they want. And then we say, OK, we're usually going to be working around their customers uh, paperwork and we'll just basically fit our knowledge in around that. But we'll, you know, a sim study is is something that's been around for quite a number of years. Um, most of the Irish molding companies, most of the trade molders, most of the medical device companies are doing a sim study, which is a scientific way of finding your best process. Basically, it's effectively an Excel spreadsheet based way of setting up your molding process. So stim, sim study typically finds your, your best nominal process. And then a validation finds your window, your process window, your highs and your lows. And often then a DOE is used to try and challenge those highs and lows to see where they will fit in to give you your, your critical dimensions. So a DOE will tell you how to hit your critical dimensions. So as I say, we used to do DOEs in our module three course and we used to do a sim study in our module four course. And then looking at what the industry was doing, we changed that a number of years ago. So we're, we're doing a sim study first now and then um, the DOE is, is included as part of our module four, but also part as a, as a dedicated DOE course. Um, so yeah, the, the, that's the long answer. The short answer is yes, we do scientific injection molding. Uh, and just to cut in there on the LSR, uh, Ramina, um, yeah, so look, um, LSR is becoming more popular um, within the uh, industry. So it's something we're excited to actually be working with the app department there and collaborating with it. So uh, with them, um, so we have a machine on site here. Uh, we don't know a lot about it yet. We are working through the logistics of it, but we hope to um, we hope to learn a lot about it in the next while. So, um, yeah, I, what I'd say is watch the watch this uh, space for for future courses on LS, LSR. That's great to know. Thanks. Um, 
Thanks. Uh, Ramina, I would maybe point out there as well that if, if anyone is looking at getting into LSR, just to be aware that it is a slightly different beast to, to injection molding. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's technically more, if you like, more difficult because parts flash so easily. Uh, molds have to be produced to a, a higher level. They have to fit together. To, you know, your mold handling requirements are a lot different. So it's 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 not something that you should jump into and trying to buy a machine and try and buy a mold and trying to mix and match the two and get a result is difficult. So a lot of companies would have had more, better success over the years by trying to get a bespoke, like a turnkey solution where they would go to a machine manufacturer and get the machine manufacturer and the, and the mold maker to collaborate, get them something that's delivered on site, is tested and is ready to go. So it's, it's just, it's technically, generally I would say more challenging than processing thermoplastics. You know, just for anyone, just to be aware of that it's a, it is a different piece, as I say. Great. Now, the very valid point is completely different process, absolutely. Um, what are the current trends for industry needs in Ireland? And what do the first polymer training team think the future needs will be over the coming three years? Um, well, I would say, Romina, I suppose we've seen them um, over the last number of years, a trend developing where, you know, before an injection molding technician would only be managing the injection molding machine, but now they have to have automation skills. Maybe they're managing vision systems or managing the robots and all of that. So it's really, and um, we're seeing a lot of companies maybe getting operators upskilled to a basic level to manage robots and automation systems as well. So, so I suppose it's really about multi-skilling, cross-skilling people. So people are expected to do more acro across a wider range of production lines and to be not pigeonholed, just doing you know, managing the molding machines or whatever, they're managing a lot more. Um, so I think that would be a trend. And I think um, we're seeing a, a lot more, I suppose, like Alan mentioned about the electrical maintenance courses that technicians are expected to be able to fix basic faults on shift so the machines are not down. And then obviously electrician is called in when he needs to, he or she needs to be called in. Safety is a big part. I don't know if um, Alan or Stephen want to add any more to that. No, I think you've covered it pretty well there, Katrin. Yeah, I mean, definitely the automation side of it. Um, I know from chatting to some companies that they will generally look for technicians that have an automation background or have done, for example, mechatronics type training before. So not every company, but I'm just saying some companies are saying that's the type of person that they're looking for. You know, typically going back 25 years, uh, companies were looking for mechanics and people that have like in, you know, machine based knowledge to, to work as setters and technicians. So they, they typically take on someone that had maybe qualified as a mechanic or qualified as a fitter, whereas now it's moving more towards a mix of automation and pneumatics and like electrical knowledge, as well as plastics knowledge. I would say another trend too is for companies to develop their own people. Obviously, you know, attracting people and retaining people is a challenge now. So they're giving their own employees the opportunity to go on the apprenticeships or, we're working with the company now who are trying to engage with their local community college to try and attract people that maybe are not thinking of going to third level and try and build their own apprenticeship, informal apprenticeship scheme in-house to, to just to retain people locally. So they're trying to recruit, recruit locally and retain locally and give their existing employees all of the opportunities to upscale and do the part-time programs or the apprenticeship programs because, you know, obviously skills, attraction and retention is huge and it's one of the biggest issues at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, one last question, um, and it's coming back to the sustainability, and it's around um, in the presentation you highlighted the recyclability or and reusable of, of polymers and as, as a part of, of the activities. What about uh, biodegradable polymers? Is there much industry interest? Yeah, so that did actually come up at our eco-design conversation as to biosourced polymers and biodegradable polymers. Um, I suppose at this stage, we are just trying to put a, a, a higher level framework in place. And then over the next year, we hope to get much deeper. What myself and Alan are actually enrolled in a really interesting webinar that's happening next week from the British Plastics Federation. And they're going to be looking at biodegradable polymers as well. But it's very specifically about polymer processing. And that's where we want to get by next year. So now we're just trying to develop a framework that will give companies the tips and tools to be able to start on that journey, develop an action plan, an initial one, and look at specific areas. But looking at recyclability, you know, material selection, what polymers do you choose, water solid, that, 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 that we're not there yet, but we are um, hoping to get delved deeper into those topics after we develop the initial framework. But now it's just a more, more of a high level to get companies started on this journey. But again, it's, it's a huge area, but we're really interested. It's the 8th and 9th of June, if anybody's interested. The British Plastics Federation are doing a really interesting two mornings on 
sustainability, but specifically for polymer processing and looking at specific areas on, on these, particularly on biodegradable polymers is one of the sessions. That's great, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I, we finished the, with the question and answer session. So I thank you all again, Catherine, Stephen, Alan, for joining us today. It was fantastic talks, uh, very comprehensive and educative. And I look forward to chatting with you soon.